happening. We're going to review uh, the trial. So I'm going to go really quickly and not into too much detail, but just to give you an overview of what was done uh, since uh, 2010. So basically, this is the IRIS Partner 1A trial that compare uh, IRIS uh, TAVR versus SAVR. They include less than 1,000 patients. It was a non-inferiority trial. The mean age of the patient was 83 years old, and it was the first generation valve that was included, uh, which is the Sapien valve. They included alternative access, so uh, 104 patient had the trans apical or direct aortic access, um, and the other one was uh, transfemoral. The primary endpoint for this trial was death from any cause at one year, and it was an intention to treat analysis. The results were, so basically the rate of death from any cause were 3.4% uh, TAVI group versus 6.5, which was not significant at 30 days, and 24 versus 26% at one year, which was not significant, but it was um, it indicated the non-inferiority of TAVR over SAVR. And here, those are the five real five-year results of the partner 1A trial, and soon we're gonna have the 10-year results as well. Uh, but it continued to show the non-inferiority of TAVR over SAVR, no significant difference in terms of the primary endpoint between the two groups. Uh, CORVALF uh, did the same thing with their US CORVALF trial, that was the IRIS, so mean age was the same, about the same amount of patients that were included. It was a randomized controlled trial. They did a non-inferiority and the superiority. The primary endpoint was the same, which was the rate of death from any cause at one year. So basically what they found is that the results were similar in the intention to treat analysis between both groups, but in the as treated analysis, the rate of death from any cause at one year was significantly significantly lower in the TAVR group than in the surgical group, 14% versus 19%. So it was non-significant for uh, non-inferiority and superiority, but only in the as-treated analysis. Here you can see also their five-year results, which show no difference. It's a TAVI is non-inferior to uh, SAVR in this high-risk category group of patients. So TAVI is as good as surgery for iris patients. So let's continue with the intermediate risk patient now. So this is the partner 2A trial. So um, they included the Sapien, the first generation valve and the Sapien XT. So the mean age of those patients still high, 82 years old. They included more patients. Now it's like more, a little bit more than 2000 patients. They changed their primary endpoint. So it was death from any cause or disabling stroke at 24 months. 76% uh, of the cohort was a TF, 24 was transthoracic. Uh, and uh, in terms of their composite endpoint, it was similar. Uh, so it was, oh, it was non-inferior TAVI over SAVI in this cohort of patient. In the cohort of TF patient, there was less death or disabling stroke than surgery. And in the transthoracic, it was similar, but the trial was not um, uh, created to see that kind of difference. So we didn't see any difference up to two years. And those are the five year, year results that were recently published that continue to show no difference in between the two groups. Uh, for the SIRTAVI trial, which is the intermediate risk trial for core valve, the composite endpoint was the same, death from any cause or disabling stroke at 24 months. They include more than 1,000 patients. The mean age, they were a little bit younger, 79 years old. It was a non-inferiority uh, trial, TAVI over surgery. So in terms of the complications, surgery, uh, in the surgery group, we found more acute kidney injury, AFib, and transfusion as expected. In the TAVR group, more residual aortic insufficiency and pacemaker. The thing, uh, they publish also their five-year results, and we started to see a signal about more re-intervention in uh, for the aortic valve, 2% TAVI versus 0.8% uh, uh, surgery. And the cause of re-intervention on the aortic valve was for a valve thrombosis, and we're going to discuss about that a little bit later. This is the partner three trial uh, comparing for the Edwards trial comparing low risk patient TAVI versus surgery. They didn't include in the low risk the alternative access. This was only TF. Uh, they include a thousand patient. The primary endpoint they added a rehospitalization, so death stroke rehospitalization at one year. It was a non inferiority and superiority trial, and the mean age was seventy three years old. So in terms of the primary uh, endpoint, composite endpoint, there was a reduction of the composite uh, by, I think it was 
46% TAVI versus surgery. In terms of death from any cause, there was no significant difference in, term, uh, in between groups. Uh, isolated stroke, they saw a significant difference in the first 30 days, but it was no significant uh, difference after that in one year. And in terms of rehospitalization, there was a significant difference, more rehospitalization for surgery than TAVI. This is a paper that was published in March 2021 about the two years outcome of the partner three trial. Okay, and here I'm not going to read that. I'm just going to show you the graph because um, you're going to see this in terms of the composite. Um, so we saw that there was a 46% uh, percent difference here. The, the difference is less, 37% less of the composite outcome, TAVI versus surgery, still higher for surgery in a significant way. In terms of death or disabling stroke, um, there was a significant difference here at one year, but there's no difference at two years. So there was more uh, death or disabling stroke for surgery, but after you see here, that it increased a little bit more. It's tr it triples, in fact, for TAVI, and it kind of stayed the same for surgery. In terms of the death, there was no difference at 12 months and 24 months between groups, but you see that the difference in mortality double for um, TAVI over surgery that stayed fairly constant. In terms of stroke, there was more st stroke, like we said, uh, for surgery, but there's increase in stroke between the first and second year for TAVI as well. And we're gonna discuss also about that. Uh, in terms of rehospitalization, it stayed the same, but it increased uh, slightly. So at two years, the, uh, there was more valve thrombosis according to the VARC2 definition, okay? So SAVR, 0.7% versus TAVI, 2.6%. At one year, we didn't see that significant difference, but we can see it now. Um, for the patient who got thrombosis, 54% we saw on the echo an increase in the aortic gradient. Um, the, did it have its clinical significance? No, but uh, we're still going to continue to follow those patients. There was no significant uh, structural valve deterioration or reintervention between the one and second year. And in terms of the L status, it continued to be better after TAVI versus uh, surgery through uh, two years. For the Evolute low risk trial, they include uh, 1,468 um, patients. The mean age was 74 years old. Uh, what was interesting is that for their analysis, when 850 patients had reached 12 months follow up, they analyzed the data regarding the primary endpoint, a composite of death or disabling stroke at 24 months using this method. So basically what they found is uh, there was for the primary endpoint, it was 5.3% in the TAVR group versus 6.7% in the surgery group. So TAVI was not inferior to surgery as well. But the thing is we saw very uh, quickly all the trials and what were the point of those trial. But to be eligible for those trials, patient had to meet strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. So you need, while interpreting this trial, you need to be sure that those patients are the one that you are treating in, in your clinic. And if we look at the exclusion criteria in those trials, they were very, very selective. So they excluded bicuspid valves, severe LV dysfunction, severe calcification of the aortic valvular complex, a vascular anatomy that was not safe for TF, complex CAD with syntax score more than 32 in the CORVAV trial and more than 22 in the PARTNER trial. They excluded low coronary takeoff, mixed aortic disease, aortic insufficiency, and aortic stenosis. If you had a previous valve in place, you couldn't be part of those trials or extreme annulus sizes. And they exclude as well patient with severe mitral regurgitation or patient with a previous mitral prosthesis or annuloplasty. Uh, in terms of the clinical, um, clinical comorbidities, they excluded acute MI, stroke or TIA within 90 days, severe renal insufficiency, hemodynamic or respiratory instability, and more than two criteria of uh, frailty. 
So we saw also in those scores, I want to discuss, like I told you, about the surgical results. So the surgical results, especially in the partner three trial, I didn't show it specifically, but the hemodynamics that were presented in those trials were fairly similar between SAVR and TAVR. And this is due to the fact that the surgeons, I think that those trials brought the awareness for the surgeons to put bigger valve because it was important because some of the contemporary data about uh, TAVI, especially in the partner partner two-way trial, 33% uh, of the patient in the surgical cohort had severe PPM. And this is important. And as surgeons, we know that, that it's related to cardiac and all-cause mortality. So I think that we were more aware of that. And in the partner three trial, the majority of the valve implant was 23 and 25. So we could be very competitive in the uh, hemodynamic um, outcomes as well. For sure, for the core valve, they had a little bit better hemodynamics because it's a supraanular valve, but it was pretty uh, similar. Um, so other trial came out. So I don't know if you are using a lot of the Resilia uh, Magna with the Resilia tissue valve, but the Ter Bavaria in 2021 at the SDS, he published the five-year results. The commenced trial, the two years are already published, but in terms of the five-year result, the mean age of the patient was 69. There was no SVD PVL in 95% of the patient. The majority of the valve implanted in this trial was 23 and 25, and all-cause early mortality, 30-day was 1.2% and late was 2.2% and early pacemaker implantation was 4.7%. Uh, last weekend, we discussed this paper uh, with the Journal of Cardiac Surgery Online about the Morjani paper that include more than 1,000 patients over 60 years old. Um, the mean age was 74. Five, the mortality was really low, 1.1%. The rate of pacemaker was 1.2%. And still, the majority of the valve implant was 21, 23, and 25. And uh, the survival rate at one and two years were 94% and 91%, which significant, significantly decreased with surgical risk and age. In the Morjani uh, court, it's a UK registry. Uh, he compared in his article the iris patient because he separated his cohort with Loris and iris, which was um, defined by Euroscore two more than four. And he compared it to the intermediate risk and low risk trial. Notion is the version, the European version. So um, the 30 day mortality was not so different. So those are our risk patient was 4.7%. And we know that the low risk patient or is 30 day mortality was 1.1%. The 30 day stroke was fairly low. And the 30 day pacemaker implantation was lower than the, in the current uh, low and intermediate stroke intermediate risk trial. The one year survival was also pretty good. So I think that the surgeons, we did a great job over the years at improving our results. This is a study that our group uh, published in Montreal about the change in outcome over time in intermediate risk patient treated for severe aortic stenosis. So basically we include 812 patients that were done at our institution, TAVR and SAVR uh, in intermediate risk patient. And we didn't see any difference in mortality between those two groups. So this is contemporary data, but there was different in complication like we uh, saw in, uh, in those trials. So more TIA for TAVI pacemaker of pervabular leak and for SAVR uh, acute kidney injury, AFib, delirium, bleeding and, length, and increased length of stay. Uh, but the thing that was interesting in our paper is to see the trends in mortality and morbidity. So over the years, those were all the patients treated for aortic stenosis, either TAVR or SAVR. And we can see that the mortality and the comorbidities increase over the years, which is really important. Of course, we improve what we were doing, but also um, it was about selection of patient and, and we probably send the patient that are at risk or prohibitive risk to TAVI instead. So who should have surgery and who should have TAVI now? And that's where the art team is really important. And I strongly encourage that you be part of that because I think uh, it's gonna be essential for the future, uh, especially with the new guidelines. So this is the ACCHA guidelines 2020. 
Okay, so if we start for the surgical cord, so for patients 50 to 65 years old who require AVR and who do not have a contraindication to anticoagulation, it is reasonable to individualize the choice of either a mechanical or bioprosthetic AVR with consideration of individual patient factors and inform shared decision making. So de decrease the age to 50 for biological valve as well, because uh, probably because of the valve in valve option for the future, but it's 2A recommendation. Of course, we had a nice talk by, uh, by uh, Ismail al um last uh, month, and uh, we need, still need to consider the ROS procedure for those very active patients uh, who are at the, their early uh, 50s as well. But here, this is the interesting thing, because for symptomatic patients with severe AS who are 65 to 80 years of age and have no anatomic, anatomic contraindication to transfemoral TAVI, either SAVR or transfemoral TAVI is recommended after shared decision-making about the balance between expected patient longevity and valve durability. So in my mind, I was still at 75 years old for either you can offer TAVR or SAVR, but they decreased the age range at 65. Um, for symptomatic patients with severe AS who are more than 80 years old of uh, or for younger patients with a life expectancy that is less than 10 years and no anatomical contraindication to transfemoral TAVI, uh, transfemoral TAVI is recommended in preference to SAVR. And this is a class 1A recommendation. So especially if you're doing, and if you're putting a biological valve in those 50 years old patient, uh, what are the possible scenario? Because you're the surgeon. So and, and you're going to be doing TAVI and SAVI and SAVR. So basically, you need to think not about what you're doing right now, but about the long-term plan as well. So what are the scenarios? SAVR, TAVI, TAVI, SAVR, SAVR, TAVI, TAVI, SAVR, TAVI, or SAVR, TAVI, or TAVI, TAVI. So those are your possible scenarios. In my practice, patients who are 75 and older without any contraindication to TAVI should have TAVI, no matter the risk category. A younger low-risk patient should have SAVR still. Uh, what is the definition of low-risk patient in the literature? So you need to have a STS less than 4%, the lack of any major indices of frailty, the lack of any major organ system compromise, and no procedural impediments. So probably for the patient that you evaluate now, they should have a CT scan uh, prior to their SAVR or TAVR. But the thing is, you're going to be confronted in your clinic about with some patients that are willing to take low risk or perhaps even consider less favorable outcomes in order to achieve a therapy which suit their particular lifestyle or their particular health and age at that time. So you need to think about that as well and be ready to explain to your patients what are the advantages and what is known and what is not known yet. And this is the thing in my mind that I still have questions and those are my unresolved questions. So patient procedures mismatch, paravalvular leak, durability, long-term results, subclinical thrombosis, the need for anticoagulation or double antiplatelet therapy, concomitant other disease, reaccess to coronary, bicuspid valve, reoperation, pacemaker and left bundle branch block. Okay, and we're gonna discuss about each of them. So in terms of the patient procedures mismatch, okay? So there's surgical series about PPM and we as surgeons, we have still have an issue. So in terms of the, this is, I did that study uh, for the sub-study uh, from the partner 2A and we found that 33% of the patient had severe PPM. And we know in the surgical literature on the mid to long, long term, severe PPM and even moderate PPM is a, could be associated with all cause and cardiac mortality. In terms of the TAVR substudy, in the first partner trial, we have, we have five year follow up. Only severe PPM was associated with cardiac mortality. So that's the thing that the surgeons, uh, that the interventional cardiologists are saying is that in your literature for uh, surgical AVR, only moderate and severe are associated. But for us, TAVI, only severe PPM is associated. But I think that they don't have long ter longer term data to, to show the, this difference. 
And in terms of PPM, TAVI is better than SAVR for native annulus that is less or equal to 20 millimeter. So when we say at large that TAVI is better than SAVR for PPM, it's not true. It's only for annulus that is less than 20 millimeter. But if you implant a TAVI, like it's 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 blinded. But if you're a surgeon and you have that kind of that type of annulus, I don't think that you should put a 19 valve in. But we have the possibility to either do a full root or to do a annulus enlargement and I think that we should do that to prevent that and it's important because it, this is the partner three trial in this supplementary um, appendix so here you can see that in the SAVR group um, 53% at severe, moderate PPM, 8.3% at uh, severe PPM, and it's comparable to the surgical cohort. So I think that we can still do better because here we, we cannot change anything about that. Um, in terms of the TVT registry, which is the equivalent of the STS for TAVR in the States. So uh, the rate of moderate PPM is 25% and the rate of severe PPM is 12%. For paravalvular leak, so the current uh, transcatheter Transcatheter art valve uh, match and may exceed hemodynamic performance of surgically implanted by prosthesis based on pressure, pressure gradient and EOA. However, these hemodynamic criteria do not account for PVL. PVL, what is the concept of energy loss? Energy loss is when the ventricle becomes the focus of evaluation rather than the systolic valve function. So PVL procures a higher diastolic stress on the art. And what is interesting about this study that was published in 2009, so they mentioned that in the presence of mild PVL, TAVR implantation imposes significantly higher workload on the left ventricle than an equivalent equivalently sized surgically implanted by prosthesis. So even mild PVL. And what about mild PVL? So you can see that the intermediate risk trial, partner 2A, mild PVL, 25% versus surgery, 3%. And the Surtavi trial, 36% mild PVL versus surgery, 6 to 9%. And in the partner 3 trial, the low risk trial, at, at most 28-30% mild PVL compared to surgery, which is 2.9%, 2.1%. What about, um, this is the a sub-study of the notion trial. What is the effect of PVL? So um, basically they compare TAVR and SAVR in terms of uh, LV uh, mass regression. And you can see that there's less LV mass regression with uh, TAVR versus SAVR. Uh, the change in end diastolic volume over one year is, um, is uh, sorry, it's less uh, for um, TAVR than SAVR. And here you can see, and this is really interesting because you can see here that the TAVR group stayed in the concentric hypertrophy while the SAVR patient, and that's what we are looking for, are going to the concentric remodeling. So I found this sub-study really interesting and they have over like 10 years results for those patients as well. And they, con they continue to follow that and it still stay in the concentric hypertrophy. And the thing is with patients, so they concluded that patient undergoing SAVR had a larger LV mass regression at one year compared with patient undergoing TAVR, and which may be due to increasing amount of PVL and pacemaker in the TAVR group. Uh, in terms of durability, so uh, as we know, durability of TAVI is less known. So we have up to five, 10 years results, uh, but we know the durability of bioprosthetic valve, especially in, in the patient over 70 years old, we know that uh, the um, bioprosthetic failure is less than 10%. The predictor of SVD, otherwise in surgical cohort, um, is patients that are younger, uh, pre-existing PPM and higher gradient. Um, Blackman in 2019 did a study on SVD at five and 10 years. This was from the UK registry. The mean age was 79 years old. And there was a 91% freedom from SVD at five years. And the cause of that was thrombus again. So what we're seeing in the current trial. There was a meta-analysis that were performed as well. And there was a higher rate of one in five years of PVL, moderate severe AI, and a re-intervention um, for TAVI. And the rate of SVD was 7% at five years, but only 12% of them underwent re-intervention. But, 
but the fact is that the mean age of those patients were 80 years old. Um, what about thrombosis and anticoagulation? So um, with the CAVI valve, with the leaflet that are still in place, there is less washout, okay? So there's the concept. And the thing is, like I was saying, that surgeons, we learn from TAVR because we started talking about HAM and HALT. HAM is uh, EPO attenuation affecting motion, H-A-M, HALT, is EPO attenuation leaflet thickening, okay? And because of the adjudicated data and also because of um, the CT scan that were done, we saw also that there was HAM and ALT in surgical valve. And some are saying also that if you give protamine after your surgery, it can cause those, those HAM or ALT. Um, so in the PARTNER3 trial, as we spoke, there is a signal at two years that there's more, more thrombosis. In the Surchavi trial at five years, there is. And it's probably caused by HALT and AM. Dr. Mack, when he presented it in ACC, the results uh, last month, um, it was the pre-recording, but uh, so uh, Dr. Mack noted that the valve thrombosis definition by VARC two criteria are outdated and may be exaggerated by recent CT imaging leaflet thickening studies. So they are currently um, writing, I think it's, uh, it's, on, it's gonna be published soon, but the VARC three criteria that will differentiate real clinical thrombosis to ALT and HAM, because he said that those ALT and HAM have no clinical significance. But when you look at their table in the partner th uh, three trial at two years, the rate of valve thrombosis was higher in the TAVR than in the surgical group. And the increase in gradient was higher in TAVR as well. And the rate of transvalvular AR was higher. So what does this gonna do on, um, long-term outcomes. In terms of the concomitant lesion, so what about asymptomatic CAD in those patients that we see for aortic stenosis, especially the proximal disease, mitral or tricuspid regurgitation, aortic aneurysm, and aortic regurgitation that are uh, mixed disease as well as aortic stenosis. What is interesting in those, we discuss about this in the partner three trial, for example, those were very selective, uh, selected patient with a lot of exclusion criteria. But still, in terms of the concomitant procedure, in the TAVR group, 7.9% had some, but as the surgeon, we did 35% of concomitant procedure for those low risk patients because we felt they needed. In terms of the evolute low risk, TAVI 6.9% of concomitant versus 26% for surgery. So it's gonna be interesting to see the effect of having done other stuff on the long-term results on survival. Of course, the mortality should be higher at the beginning because the it is a little bit, um, it's greater, but what will be the outcome on the long-term for those patients? For example, in terms of the presence of coronary artery disease. So in the high-risk trial, we saw that the patients that were included in those trials, between 60 and 80% of them had uh, prevalence of CAD. In the low risk trial, it's gonna be 20 to 30% of our patient that we're gonna see. So what are we gonna do with that? Should we revascularize? So those patients that will undergo TAVI will have PCI before, or maybe they will have PCI after. It's interesting, like we said, like the complex coronary disease were excluded from those two trials, but still twice as much as SAVR patient got, P uh, got a cabbage, uh, during their AVR. And same thing for the low risk patients. So it's double. So what will be the, um, the effect on survival for those patients compared to TAVI patients who were uh, revascularized? And it's important because especially for those lower risk patients, um, the TAVI can limit reaccess to coronary osteopus TAVR because of the interplay of the implanted valve commissure, the change in aortic root geometry and the displaced aortic valve leaflet. A MDCT study of TAVR patient found that in 51% of cases, the osteum of one or both of the coronary arteries was blocked by the neocommissure of the THV. So it's gonna be hard to reassess. To reassess. 
And one study um, reported a 10% rate of acute coronary syndrome after TAVR with 47% of cases occurring within the first year. What about mitral regurgitation? So we know that the functional MR will improve in 50 to 60% of patients post AVR. And what is predictor of a lack of improvement is congestive heart failure and large LA and post-op AI. In the partner trials, what we saw is that the patient that we left with rigid, residual moderate to severe MI uh, had higher mortality than non-mild MR, 49% versus 27.9%. What about left bundle branch? So uh, a lot of those patients, 20% of the patient in the TAVR cohort versus 8% in the SAVR cohort uh, developed left bundle branch. But what is the effect of that on the long-term outcome? Because we saw in the literature that it could be related to one-year cardiac mortality as well. And pacemaker, we know that it increased mortality at one year and doubled the risk of heart failure readmission as well. So we know that TAVI had higher rate of those two as well. What about bicuspid aortic valve? So we have different types of uh, bicuspid valve. So which one should, oh, sorry about this slide. We cannot see anything, but which one should be treated with TAVI, which one none? The only valve that is approved, FDA approved for bicuspid is, is the core valve. Uh, but should we treat all bicuspid with a core valve? So, or should we refer them to surgery? We know that the mortality is increasing depending of the type of bicuspid valve. So for example, the mortality is higher if you have bicuspid with very uh, calcified raphe and um, calcified leaflet. Uh, mortality is a little bit less if the leaflets are quite okay and the raphe is calcified. And it's better if there is a type zero or no calcification um, for bicuspid. But what we know when we do a TAVI in bicuspid versus tricuspid, if we have twice the stroke rate uh, in those patients as well. So what are the choice of TAVI procedures and access? So we are at in the Sapien fourth generation valve with the ultra uh, with the skirt that is a little bit higher and more adherent. Uh, it's a balloon expandable cobalt chromium uh, bovine pericardial valve and it has a high radial strength. Um, the sheet side size decrease over the years and those are the available prosthesis. We stopped putting the 20 uh, because the gradients, the gradients are way too high. And even in the literature now, the patients that are presenting with SVD post TAVI are the one with the smaller TAVI valve. So more degeneration in the 23 valve. So uh, we need to be careful about that now. Um, for the self-expanding valve, so uh, this is the core valve third generation Evolute Pro. They're gonna have the Evolute Pro Plus um, as well. So it's a porcine pericardial tissue valve with a nitinol uh, wireframe. Um, my choice of procedures, it, it, those are the things that are saying I'm, I don't uh, respect like uh, those two categories. Sometimes I switch, but for Edwards uh, alternative access kit, so the certitude uh, kit, uh, which is um, smaller. Um, the thing that is sad is that the company, they improved their iteration. They had new iteration of new device in the transfemoral system, but none in the um, alternative access. So it's still big, um, less user-friendly. Uh, in terms of Edwards, less pacemaker, easier access to coronary because the valve is shorter um, it is used for valve and valve mitral and tricuspid or pulmonary valve. Um, it works well with calcified leaflet because it has more radial force and it's easier in terms of when we speak with people with redo. Uh, on the contrary, the Medtronic, I use it for the smaller vessel because it's in line and you don't have to put it through a sheet. It's really 14 French. Um, we can use it to prevent rupture, LVOT annular rupture or STJ rupture uh, in very calcified because it's self-expendable, it's softer. We use it in bicuspid, a small annulus because of the hemodynamics of the supraannular valve. We use them in valve and valve, especially in smaller bioprosthesis. You can recapture if you're in doubt. Um, some are preferred. Some prefer using the core valve if there is a mitral prosthesis in place, just to be sure they position it at the right place. And because they don't have the balloon that can push the valve out um, with the uh, if it goes on the uh, prosthesis. And some are using it for LV dysfunction 
different because they don't have to rapid pace to avoid uh, instability, but I don't find that it's necessarily true. What are the approach the, and the access routes in 2021? Transfemoral, uh, we don't we don't do transepical, transaortic anymore. Uh, in the last two years, I didn't do any of those. Um, I'm using mainly transcarotid, trans. Uh, uh, retrosternal, uh, sternal, I like it through the brachiocephalic trunk, transubclavian or transcable. Um, last subject that I want to talk about is the surgeon's training and participation in TAVI procedure. So uh, we create, Tom Nguyen approaches to create a group of younger surgeon and uh, with more experienced surgeon as well to discuss about that. And we publish a paper about the, uh, can surgeons still get a ticket to treat structural heart disease? Because I think it's, it's really hard, especially for the surgeons that are already in practice to get involved in that. Um, and, and we came out with uh, some of the, our, what we thought was the surgeon's training and, and, and what should be the, the, their participation in TAVI procedure. So I invite you to read this article because I think it's really interesting. So basically what we can do is, is we can like in our program, okay? So what are we gonna do? Are we gonna build in rotation during integrated CT surgery residency? So we have one rotation at University of Montreal. It's only three months. And I don't think that, I think it's more introductory to TAVI because I think it's not fair when the cardiology fellow is doing a full year of fellowship in TAVI. So I think that you should, you could learn in three months to do all those things. But I think that for now, it's not enough. And you need probably the best thing for now is to have a dedicated six to one year postgraduate uh, fellowship in structural heart disease uh, to be very efficient and, and by yourself and just to be um, uh, credible or in front of the cardiologist as well. Um, in terms of the, the, the training that you did. And for the surgeons that are already in practice, we were thinking about establishing proctorship at an established structural heart um, institution where they have a program um, a little bit to um, train them as well. Because some program, I think that all the program needs um, to have a surgeons in their team and the, the best heart team are the one that can collaborate together. Uh, other than that, there is society or industry sponsored course that you can go. There's collaboration with industry. Uh, there's attendance of a national and international conference where they have workshop on TAVI as well. There is books. Well, you need all this to be um, proficient um, in the management of valve disease via surgical, hybrid, and transcatheter approaches. And of course, the surgeons need to be involved in pre-case planning, procedural skills. He needs to do the procedure and post-procedural management as well. I'm not going to go into to too much detail, but uh, that's the main thing that I want to say. In conclusion, um, Tevi made us aware, surgeons, of severe weaknesses, and surgeons need to constantly improve their technique and approach to be competitive uh, over the TAVR world. And, and we know that because some are even saying that those randomized trials will compare TAVI versus surgery. They should compare, in fact, TAVI versus minimally invasive AVR surgery. So we need to constantly improve our approach or uh, techniques in performing TAVR. In the last few years, TAVI had changed the field of aortic valvular disease and will continue to do so. And with and it will do the same thing with other valves. So mitral valve tricuspid. Uh, trials, just be careful. Like I said, it's very selective patient and it's industry sponsored as well. And the selection of patient is key, but many question as we discuss today uh, remain. And it's gonna be an interesting to discuss about those points with you uh, in the, questions. Um, so it is now more important than ever for surgeons to continue to leverage their knowledge and experience treating valvular disease surgically and obtain the necessary skill set to actively participate in the treatment of percutaneous structural heart disease. And I think that we can still catch the train. So I will finish with that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Priscilla, for that very informative uh, talk. We will have a question period now, guys. So you can either unmute your mic, you can put it in the chat, you can raise your hand, whatever you like to do. I think the easiest really is just to unmute your mic and then 
speak up. Um, but maybe I'll just go ahead. I'm just curious because obviously, yeah, we definitely across Canada. Um, I'm sure it looks different at different centers with respect to the heart team. How did you find where um, you know you're a, new, a newer staff? Like, how did you? How do you find it or how is it working at your center with interventional cardiology and you are you going alternating cases alternating days or what does that look like that structure yeah i think that because i had a formal training they felt that they couldn't do much uh in terms of um putting me aside i think that they realized that i was bringing also other stuff because at the beginning they were doing uh trans uh direct or trans apical i came with the trans carotid the rich external and stuff so i think they saw the add-on value i got a different experience by going to a center that were diff that was different than the one that they did their fellowship. So even if the volume I came back and the volume was not too high, they included me, okay? It, it needed a lot of discussion, but I think there's a plus value. Also, um, the they didn't have a surgeon that was actively involved doing the clinic, the pre-planning of the cases, reconstructing the CT scan and three mencio. So all those things that I was doing, so they saw that they could uh, benefit from my help by doing also all those kind of things and being involved from pre, peri, and post. And then just a follow up on that. So for the cases where it's a, or you're doing a retrosternal or a trans carotid or whatever, are you bringing in another surgeon to assist with you? Or are they yeah, okay? Yeah, we have two surgeons that were already involved in the program uh, since the beginning, and they are there and they are very interested. And uh, I'm so now they are doing also those kind of access as well. So yeah, we're two for alternative access. They were two surgeons and and one interventional cardiologist. Awesome. So Ricky, mm -hmm. go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Fursillo, uh, Ricky Miller Moran here from the University of Manitoba. Thanks for doing this talk. I have a question on alternative access and I, I wanna see if I can phrase this correctly, but I'm wondering your opinion on whether um, non-candidacy for a transfemoral TAVR may in fact be a reason to proceed to go back up the decision-making algorithm towards SAVR as opposed to an alternative access TAVR. And what I mean by that is, you know, in the trials, if you look at, of course, transfemoral has, has been the one that has shown the most benefit for TAVI. And even the latest guidelines, they really essentially endorse uh, mainly transfemoral TAVR. So I guess if I think, I, I guess I'm sort of contemplating in my head, is there such thing as high risk TAVR, right? Because we know the concept of high risk SAVR is very well established and could a high risk TAVR potentially, you know, direct a patient back towards the, the operating room? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say that this situation that I see sometimes, if, if those patients are I, uh, at high risk, we're going to say it's uh, transfemoral TAVR or nothing or medical treatment. For my alternative access, I agree with you that uh, at the beginning, the result for direct aortic and transepical show similar results, like no benefit of TAVI for those approach. For me, in my experience, and some of the paper as well, trans carotid, trans subclavian, my patients are leaving day one at home as well, okay? They don't stay longer. My mean length of stay or median length of stay is one day for those alternative access as well. So uh, they are intubated, extubated in the room and they leave the next day. So I think that there's still a benefit, even if those patients that cannot be TF to do another kind of alternative access that you're gonna be comfortable and you're gonna have uh, good results with. Great, thank you. Awesome, I think we have three yeah. questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is from Malik Mardat, a cardiology resident, asking, do you think that the risk of permanent pacemaker can be reduced if we CT all the patients pre tavi saver for annulus measurements, which I think we do, at least at our center, we do, Dr. Priscilla, what's... I think he wants to say patient procedures mismatch, right? Yes, he put a correction there. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so for I'm gonna answer it still for the pacemakers. Some are measuring on the CT scan, the membranous septum uh, height. There's predictors of 
higher implant pacemaker implants. So the CT scan can give you some of those information. Yes. For patient prosthesis mismatch, uh, I would say that like for SAVR patient, even, even, even if you know that the chart that we are now are not that accurate uh, at, predicting, at predicting PPM, um, what I do to prevent the risk of PPM, so I look at the CT scan for the annular measurement, either area or perimeter. And if, depending on the BSA of the patient, if it's a 23 sapient versus a 26 core valve, I'm going to choose the 26 core valve. I'm always choosing the bigger valve. So I don't know if that answer, but other than that, for the other... Uh, CT scan measurement other than the annular size, um, I, I, um, I don't know. He, he actually did a follow-up um, question about that. Uh, do you, do you uh, Malik, do you want to ask the question? Basically, I think he's following up with, um, so are we uh, doing so CT scan everybody for summer? Uh, oh, uh, is. So it's, uh, it's, uh, the question basically is because the risk of post-saver patient processes mismatch are higher. I, I have a question, are we doing, are we strictly doing pre-saver, a CT, TAVI slash saver protocol yeah. to get the analyst measurement before going, uh, the patient is going for saver. Is that something that uh, uh, cardiosurgery guidelines like strictly uh, uh, recommend or uh, it's no it's not strictly recommended and for now it's it's not the 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 practice in, in the majority of the center but i think that we could possibly benefit from doing that especially that maybe now because of the guidelines all the patient over 65 will be discussed as part of the art team and maybe we should have an angel scan for all those patients thank you very much Okay, so then Mohammed asked, um, how many cases on average do you need to be trained in TAVI, whether as a postgraduate fellowship versus within residency? Yeah, the thing that we came out after a group discussion, but it's really group discussion, it's like to have at least 50 TAVI as a first operator. Um, some studies are saying 25 studies that you, you can be really proficient. I think that the learning curve is really, um, it's not a lot. So, and especially if, um, no, I'm not gonna say that. I'm not gonna say, especially for the surgeon. I'm not gonna say that. But um, I think it's, it's, really, um, it's really easy to learn and it's really reproducible. Um, I think that the main thing, the main difficulty, it's the selection of patient and knowing the literature and what will benefit the patient and what will be the long-term plan for that patient. I think that's the uh, hardest thing, but doing the procedure per se, I think it, it, the, the, um, it's easy, but I would say 25, 25 to 50 cases. Okay, and then uh, Rashmi, she's a resident in Toronto, asked, uh, I had a question about the valve thrombosis. What do, you, what do we think is the reason for the thrombosis? Do you think TAVI advocates would say that some anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy could adequately manage valve thrombosis and reduce the risk of stroke and structural valve deterioration? Yeah, so uh, the Galileo trial that was stopped because of the adverse events and bleeding and major complication, so showed on the long term that there was no difference in, in terms of valve durability for TAVI, okay? The thing you saw that the partner three in the two, from the, the first to second year, there's an increase in stroke, uh, there's an increase in death, and uh, there's an increase in thrombosis. And probably the stroke, they think that it's because of the HALT and HAM as well, okay? Um, but the trials that, are, that they did on anticoagulation or, or double antiplatelet, it didn't have any effect on structural valve deterioration can it have an effect on stroke? Um, it didn't show in the one that were done um, and stopped, uh, but um, I, don't, I don't have any other data on that. Okay, uh, thank you. And then also Olivia, you've raised your hand, so you can definitely go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Purcell. Very good presentation. Thank you. I uh, was just wondering, um, do you have any experience in uh, TAVI in Inspirus valve? And do you think there's a real benefit of putting that valve in 
to plan a TAVI procedure as a second step? Um, the only experience that I have with the Inspiris, it's uh, bench testing. Uh, when I went to California to test that valve uh, for valve and valve. So uh, it opened really well, like this little inch mechanism that can open, it, it opened well. But the thing is, it was on bench testing and I don't know what it will do in a patient with all the panis and all the fibrosis around the analyst. Is it gonna be so easy like with this to, to open this valve? I really don't know. Thanks. Oh, one more question it looks like in the chat from Jimmy. Um, so he is asking, do you foresee prospective trials coming out for some of these relatively unanswered questions for TAVI, such as data on patient prosthesis mismatch, paravalvular leak, bicuspid valves, pacemaker, concomitant cases, or will it mostly be surgeons and interventionalists relying on retrospective observational studies and meta-analysis to make clinical decisions on these subset of patients? Yeah, uh, very interesting um, question. Um, there is an ongoing trial on revascularization prior or post TAVR, uh, especially for patients with personal CAD. There is ongoing trial on bicuspid valves. Um, the effect of paravalvular leak, I think we're just going to see it on the long term uh, for patients that are currently involved in the trial. Same thing for pacemaker. Um, same thing for other concomitant lesion as well. Um, I think those observations, but for now, the trials that are ongoing, it's, um, was, was it other trial as well? Uh, I would say coronary revascularization bicuspid valve. But also the thing is we have the VIVA trial for small analysts as well. So um, the Tara Descabo in Quebec is doing the one um, uh, surgery versus TAVI in uh, small analysts. So we're going to have that as well in terms of PPM. Um, we have the trials valve and valve. We didn't discuss in this presentation of valve and valve, uh, Medtronic versus uh, Sapien as well. So there are still on other ongoing trial. We have the trials for asymptomatic AS. We have the trial for moderate AS, the unload TAVR to see if we should be more aggressive at, as treating those pathology, even if they are moderate. So, okay, thank you. And then uh, Sarah, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Purcell. Hi, Sarah. Um, my question is that how many patients from your experience who had a previous SABR and come to you get rejected because of any other cause and they go to surgery? Yeah. The majority of the valve that we are treating for valve and valve are the 19 and the 21 valve, okay? It comes a little bit to my point that I did with the 23 that we're degenerating more. Even in surgery, we see that our smaller valve are deteriorating more as well. So for valve and valve saver, what you need to have is uh, the people that are uh, declined for uh, valve and valve is the one that don't have the VTC distance, the valve to coronary distance, that is the horizontal measure uh, from the opening of the valve uh, to the coronary. So uh, those patients, either if they are too iris, we, uh, we offer a medical treatment or we offer surgery uh, for this patient. So basically, what is limiting this is the risk of coronary obstruction or if they have any other concomitant uh, lesion or uh, something else that will, that they will benefit more from surgery. All right, I think, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Persolo for taking the time uh, to, to do this lecture as well as answering all those questions. Um, I think with that, uh, we'll conclude today's session. And uh, uh, just remind everyone that the session will be available on our YouTube channel at the CSCS um, and uh, go from there. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Persola, from everyone. Uh, My this pleasure. Was fantastic. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. All right. Bye, everyone. Yeah.